My name is Hezekiah, and this is my story. My story is an excellent example of God's intervention in the life of his people. My name means God strengthens, and it makes a lot of sense because I faced many challenges in this life. The kingdom of Israel is divided. Most members of the tribe of Benjamin, as well as members of the tribe of Judah, settled as the kingdom of Judah, sometimes known as the southern kingdom of Israel, with its capital in Jerusalem. The other ten tribes retained the title of Israel and became the northern kingdom, with its capital in Shechem, in Samaria. I am the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. My father was an evil king, and God was very displeased with him, allowing the king of Aram to defeat him in battle. My father practiced many destructive practices, such as idolatry and sacrileges against the temple of the Lord. He completely turned away from God and began sacrificing to the gods of Damascus, who had defeated him. This is strange considering that my grandfather was a good king, so it's not clear why my father strayed so far from the teachings of the Lord. His abhorrent activities included executing my brothers, which was a colossal evil that the kingdom of Israel had been practicing. My own father executed his sons. Now, I am king, and my own reign began when I was 25 years old. I found myself behaving honorably in the eyes of the Lord, mirroring everything that David, my ancestor, had done in the past. I removed the high places of pagan worship, smashed the images, the memorial stones, and cut down the Asherah poles, which is the name of a pagan goddess of fertility and the wooden cult object dedicated to her. Asherah poles were almost always referred to as sacred poles erected in honor of the fertility goddess. Scripture also makes reference to carved images of Asherah. As soon as Joshua died, worship of Asherah plagued Israel due to the incomplete conquest of Canaan. Asherah poles were commonly called groves. Regarded as the moon goddess, Asherah was often depicted as the consort of Baal, the sun god. Despite clear instructions from God, worship of Asherah was a recurring problem in Israel as Solomon sank deeper into idolatry. One of the pagan deities he brought into the kingdom was Asherah, called the goddess of the Sidonians. That was what I destroyed. God utterly detests idolatry. It draws God's wrath upon those involved. Sadly, the condition of the Levites in the temple was very poor. The Levites were a tribe of Israelites descended from Levi, the priests of Israel. They were a select group of qualified men from the tribe of Levi, responsible for various aspects of worship in the tabernacle or the temple. According to the law, all priests were to be Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Even these men had closed the doors of the outer room, extinguished the lamps, and not burned incense or offered burnt offerings. This happened in my father's days. I realized it was necessary to reopen the temple for cleansing and ensure its proper functioning. So I smashed to pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for until those days the Israelites had been burning incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture. What a pity that the object God used to free his people became an object of worship. I recognized that the calamities that had befallen us were because of our disobedience. I chose to honor God and not follow in the footsteps of my father, King Ahaz. I called the priests and Levites to focus on their calling, for the Lord had chosen them. Refocusing on their calling and central purpose of serving and honoring, rely on my defensive alliance with Egypt. They would help us. Yet the prophet Isaiah did all he could to discourage me and the leaders of Judah from trusting in Egypt. Isaiah said, those who trust in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. On that day, the people who live on this coast will say, Look what happened to those we trusted, to those we turned to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. So how can we escape? The Lord wanted Judah to trust in him rather than Egypt. Sennacherib besieged Jerusalem. We were trapped like a caged bird. A siege is when an enemy surrounds a city, castle, or other building, preventing anyone from escaping and food from entering. It was essential for the people inside the castle to be prepared. They needed supplies of food and water to survive. Getting fresh food was difficult, so they needed to find ways to preserve food, drying, salting, and storing it. For a safe water supply, castles needed their own well. Hunger was used as a weapon. If a castle had good defenses, attackers often decided to wait and try to kill the defenders by starvation. It was not uncommon for those inside the castle to resort to eating their horses or even their dogs and cats. As supplies dwindled, hungry defenders were sometimes forced to abandon the castle surrendering it to the besiegers. 
Famine was a key factor, but attacking armies also faced problems. Maintaining a large enough army to besiege a large castle and keeping them fed and armed was an extremely expensive challenge. Royal armies often gave farmers no choice if they did not sell their produce to the army at low prices. So Sennacherib sent his chief officers, the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshake, along with a large army from Lachish to Me in Jerusalem. The Rabshaka was a title describing the Assyrian army's field commander, representing the Assyrian king Sennacherib. They went up to the mountain and came to Jerusalem. After they went up the mountain and came to Jerusalem, they stopped by the aqueduct of the upper pool. It seemed like the Rabshaka had the situation completely under control. He managed to enter the city of Jerusalem and stand at the vital water source that was Jerusalem's sustenance when under siege. While he was there, three officials of my government went to meet him. Eliakim, who was in charge of my household, Shebna, a scribe, and Joah, son of Asaph, the secretary, went out to meet him. My fears came true. The tribute did not work to appease Judah. Now he will bring destruction upon us. When this happened, we had to prepare for a siege. I ordered the water from the springs outside the city to be cut off in connection with the tunnel to keep the water supply safe within the city. We also rebuilt all the broken walls and raised them up to the towers. Then the Rabshaka said to them, Tell Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is the reason for this confidence that you have? You say, but they are just empty words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now listen, you are trusting in Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff. If a man leans on it, it will only go into his hand and be it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust and depend on him. The Rabshaka wanted me to lose confidence in my Egyptian alliance, but it makes sense to make a defensive alliance with Egypt. Egypt seems to be the only nation strong enough to stand against the mighty Assyrians. Egypt made an attempt to fulfill its promises, and its army was defeated at El Tenge. The Rabshaka saw this. The Rabshaka anticipated the response of Judah's leaders. We would say, Rabshaka, you say we cannot trust Egypt? Fine, we won't trust, but we can trust the Lord our God. So the Rabshake said, But if you tell me that we trust and depend on the Lord our God, was it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed and said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship only before this altar in Jerusalem? The Rabshake knew of the fact that I had carried out extensive reforms in Judah, one of which was the destruction of the high places. Nevertheless, the Rabshake was convinced that God was truly angry with my reforms. As a result, he believed that I should not expect assistance from the Lord, God of Israel. The Rabshaka would say, Look, all the places where people used to worship the Lord, God of Israel, there used to be many since Hezekiah came to power. Now there is only one place, but it's always better. So the Lord, God of Israel, must be quite angry with Hezekiah. The enemy of our souls has a skillful way of encouraging our obedience. Since he commanded much more powerful armies, he was in a position to march straight to Jerusalem without this little speech. But the Rabshaka would prefer that Judah simply give up out of fear, discouragement, or despair. The Rabshaka said, Now make an agreement with my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will give you two thousand horses if on your part you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse even the least of my master's servants? When you trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen, now I have come up against this place to destroy it without the Lord's approval. God told me to destroy you. I am just doing his will, and there is nothing you can do to stop it, so you had better surrender. At this point, the Rabshakeh mocked our relatively small army. He said to them, even if we were to assist you with 2,000 horses, it would not help. His basic message was that we could beat him with one hand tied behind our backs. You can imagine how difficult it was for my government to hear this. My people were also sitting on the walls, listening to the Rabshaka. My men were thinking, it's bad enough that we have to hear this, but since he's speaking in Hebrew, everyone will hear him, and soon the people will become so discouraged that they will rise up against us and make us surrender. So Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, My master sent me only to your master and to you to say these things. He did not send me to the men who are on the wall, who are condemned by the siege to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine, along with you. 
It did not matter to the Rabshaka whether the common people of Jerusalem could hear him or not. That was one of his goals. The more fear, discouragement, and despair he could spread, the better he liked it. Telling the Rabshaka not to do this was equivalent to telling a naughty child not to do something. He could barely contain his excitement in addressing the people of Jerusalem. So the Rabshaka stood and shouted aloud in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria, who says, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to rescue you from my hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust and depend on the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely rescue us, and this city of Jerusalem will not be delivered into the hand of the king of Syria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you may eat from his own vine and fig tree, and each may drink the waters of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, so that you may live and not die. Do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? The Rabshakeh's speech was designed to glorify the enemy facing the people of God. He wanted to sow seeds of doubt among God's people regarding their leaders. The Rabshakeh's speech was designed to instill a sense of fear and doubt in the hearts of the people. He wanted to convince his audience that surrendering would be advantageous. The Rabshakeh referred to the policies of forced resettlement practiced by the Assyrians after defeating a nation. They would relocate their citizens to other lands to keep the morale of the people crushed and their power weak. The words of the Rabshake were crafted to give the impression that this terrible fate had some redeeming qualities. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva in the land of the Euphrates? They rescued Samaria, the capital of Israel, from my hand, which among all the gods of the lands has rescued their land from my hand, that the Lord should rescue Jerusalem from my hand. But the people remained silent and did not answer him, for I had commanded them not to respond. It is often futile, if not dangerous, to try to compete in cunning with such wicked logic. It is often wiser to remain silent and have faith in God rather than trying to argue. I understand that the safeguarding of Israel depended not only on fortifications like walls, towers, shields, and water supplies, but also on the courage, bravery, and resolve of our soldiers. So. Eliakim, Shebna, the scribe, and the secretary came to me with their clothes torn in mourning and despair, and they told me what the Rabshaka had said. When I heard it, I tore my clothes, covered myself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. The tearing of clothes and the use of sackcloth, a rough material similar to burlap, were traditional ways of showing extreme mourning, usually for the death of a loved one. I took the news about the Rabshaka seriously because I knew how determined Jerusalem's enemy was to completely conquer Jerusalem. Jerusalem's situation was desperate, and I knew it. There were good reasons to be humble before the Lord. City after city fell into the hands of Sennacherib, and long lines of deportees were already beginning their bitter journey into exile. I sought the face of the Lord God and asked for help, for we are powerless in this situation on our own. I sent Eliakim, who was in charge of my household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet's son of Amos. I told them to pass this message to Isaiah. This is a day of distress and rebuke, of punishment and humiliation, for children have come to the point of birth, but there is no strength to deliver them. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshaka, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Pray for the remnant that still survives of the people of Judah. I instructed my messengers to convey these things to Isaiah so they could convey the complete and total disaster that had befallen the nation. The only thing that gave us hope was that God would take offense at Sennacherib's insults and punish him for them. His speech is blasphemous like no other. So my servants went to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, Tell your master this. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of the words you have heard with which the servants Isaiah was aware that he spoke as a prophet of the Lord. Isaiah speaking for the Lord was about to make a bold prediction. 
His prophecy would either be fully vindicated or it would not happen at all. Isaiah would be known as either a true prophet or a false prophet. Soon this made me realize that the words of the Rabshakeh were just words. I didn't need to fear them. I was comforted by these words. Now the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah, saying that he had heard those words. It was evident that God took this offense personally. The Lord called the Rabshakeh and the other officers of the army servants of the king of Assyria. So the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, a fortified city in Judah. While the Rabshakeh was away, the Assyrians discovered that Egyptian troops, led by an Ethiopian monarch, were advancing from the south. This would be the Egyptian intervention that Assyria feared and that many in Judah relied on. As the prophet Isaiah had predicted, this would come to nothing. Nevertheless, the Assyrians sent a letter to discourage me from afar. Still, Assyria sent a message to me saying, Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by saying that Jerusalem will not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Listen, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, destroying them utterly, and you will be spared. The gods of the nations that my ancestors destroyed rescued them, Gozan and Haran in Mesopotamia, and Rezef and the people of Eden who were in Talassar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva. Sennacherib defied God. He spoke blasphemy, boasting and arrogantly assuming his own leadership. I received the letter from the messengers and there afterward I went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. I prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim of the ark and the temple, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heavens and the earth O Lord, incline your ear and hear, O Lord. Open your eyes and see. Hear the words of reproach from Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock and defy the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrians devastated the nations and their lands and cast their gods into the fire, for they were not real gods, but only the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they could destroy them. And now, O Lord our God, please save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know without a doubt that you, O Lord, are God. Then Isaiah, son of Amoz, sent a message to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have heard your prayer to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and mocked you. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind you, whom have you mocked and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. Through your messengers you have mocked and defied the Lord. You have boasted arrogantly. With my many chariots I have ascended to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars and its choicest cypress trees. I have entered its furthest lodging place, its densest forest. I have dug wells and drunk foreign waters, and with the sole of my foot I have dried up all the rivers of Egypt. Have you not heard? I determined it long ago. I planned it from days of old. Now I have brought it to pass that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants were powerless. They were dismayed and put to shame. They were like plants of the field, like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, scorched before it is grown up. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your arrogance has come to my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your lips, and I will make you return by the way you came, and this shall be the sign for you, Hezekiah. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that. Then in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The survivors who remain of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward, for out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So it happened that night, that the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 men in the camp of the Assyrians. 
And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. This formidable army was annihilated in a single night by the simple and mighty intervention of God, against all odds and against all expectation. Except the expectation of faith, the Assyrian army was repelled without even firing an arrow in Jerusalem. The unstoppable was halted and the invincible was defeated. God was able to accomplish this task effortlessly. In a way, the Lord had much more difficulty in setting the hearts and minds of his people in the right place. Once they were there, it was simple for God to delegate this task to one of his angels. This happened exactly as God had foreseen. The Assyrian king departed still full of pride. The Lord God defended Jerusalem against Sennacherib and his army. It took just one stroke from the angel of the Lord to rid Judah of its enemy. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were instantly killed. The Lord is good. The Assyrian king, like Goliath, the Philistine who mocked the Lord, was defeated. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. Following this withdrawal from Judah, Sennacherib commissioned a record. The record speaks of his conquests in Judah, despite the fact that he had not conquered. It shows how Sennacherib's heart was still full of pride, even though he could not claim the conquest of Jerusalem. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of his god, that his sons, Adramalek and Sherezer, struck him down with the sword, and Ezarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. God destroyed this mighty army in one night with a simple and powerful stroke. 185,000 died by the hand of the angel of the Lord, against all odds and against all expectation, except the expectation of faith. The Assyrian army was repelled without even firing an arrow in Jerusalem. The unstoppable was halted and the invincible was defeated. This sounds like a great victory. However, there was a war that I had to face that I have not yet shared. It was not a man seeking my life, but the Lord himself. In those days, I was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, son of Amoz, came to me and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Not all people are given time to set their house in order. I would exit this earthly life. I turned to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your eyes. And I wept bitterly. I directed this prayer privately to God and not to any man. Even if God wanted my life, it is to him alone that I can appeal for deliverance. After this, Isaiah went away and then returned, he with me, saying, This is what the Lord, the God of David your father, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will surely heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add fifteen years to your life. Then Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil, and I recovered. God blessed me with two gifts. First, he granted me life. Secondly, he gave me the gift of knowing that I only had fifteen years left. My name is Hezekiah, and this is my story.